Hi. Well, um, I couldn't be happier to be here, so thank you to the organizers and to be following up so many extraordinary presentations. And so what you're gonna find here are hopefully, a, um, I've taken this opportunity of being almost last to pull a few themes through what I've heard throughout the two days with a heavy emphasis on the three presentations that we just recently heard. So what I'm thinking about here are you know, communicating the questions, then getting to the right answer or answers, and then well, something that I'm thinking a lot about lately is citizens as our research assistants. So that's kind of what we're gonna go through here. So the first one, uh, communicating the questions. I think we've talked about this theme a little bit over the last day, and especially this, after, this afternoon or before lunch. We talked about sharpening our, our um, communication, our ability to say what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And I think that comes both in our, our oral presentations, but a lot of this is in the written word, so I think our, re our, our readability is really important. And, so it's an, and not just a functional sense and grammatical sense, but really the storytelling. How can we compel people to become interested in these things and engaged with them? And that has some variance to it. And then also, it, it matters that we're all talking the same language. And we're in the room together so that we can start to talk that same language. And I'm hearing that a lot of people have been establishing common language and commonalities through a long time. And I'm glad to be a part of that. So when I think about general readability, um, I think, of course, yes, we can all sharpen it. And in fact, there's tons of, tons of books to help. Um, this one in particular is one that I like. He is a UCSB, Josh Schimmel is a UCSB faculty and has a really nice way of saying we need to take raw data and translate it into understanding, into fundamental kernels that stick with us, make a sticky story. And so I like that, that thought. And so I went back to the page, the Sackler page, and said, okay, what's the overview? What are we trying to get across on here? And I said, does this stick? How, how sticky is this? And I ran it through something called a readability algorithm. So I copied and pasted this into the readability. Yeah, I think you can kind of uh, forecast how well this went, right? So I put it in there, and we got an E. It's not E for excellent. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's just a nice way of saying F. OK? And it basically says, on, with a bunch of these, what do I do here? Where's my, nope, I did the same thing everybody else is doing this one. There we go. There's a bunch of algorithms that basically give it a score and say you're using too long of phrases, too long of words, run on too much jargon, right? And, okay, so this might be a little unfair. This is for the public. This is a public, you know, trying to make it readable for the public, and we're not the general public. Um, and clearly last night we saw from the full auditorium the Sackler colloquium is they're doing a great job at engaging and bringing in more public and, and getting people engaged. Next, I, I actually put my syllabus, my overview of my syllabus for public economics through the same algorithm. I also got an E for effort. So I realized that with all of the work I'd, and thoughtfulness I thought I'd put into that, it still wasn't readable to my students or that, that engaging. So what we can go for these algorithms, and I started tweaking with this, and I thought, oh, I'll make it into an A, and then we'll show what the difference is. But that kind of wasn't, that didn't feel like a useful exercise. Instead, I kind of wanted to think about what, what are we going for? What, let's redefine what an E means. And I really like this graphic because it kind of says, okay, a lot of us are explainers. We're really good at explaining. We have our, our fields in our heads, and we know what we're talking about. Then some of us graduate up to the elucidators. We give some insights. But some of us, like David Tillman last night, are enchanters. They take us along for the ride, they engage us with their narrative, and we want to come with us, them. They're, we're compelled by their passion. And I think that's kind of what we're striving for, and unfortunately I don't have a metric for that, but that's, to me, a nice way of saying, where, where should we be headed with our communication? Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So the other phrase that we've been hearing a lot of is ecology and economics both start with eco, but they are not the same language. So I came up with a column of some pretty, you know, general terms from economics and a nice column of general terms from ecology. And what I like to tell my students is that e economists, we love to take regular words and then use them for a really specific 
really specific context, and we get grumpy when you misuse them. And yes, that will be on the final. So, you know, we can take something like welfare, and they're like, that's just, you know, this. And I'm like, no, this is what we mean by welfare, and you're going to have to know that later. Ecologists have all these very specific scientific realms, and therefore they're going to come up with Latin terms and really niche kind of terms. And yet we're trying to, you know, intermix the two. And so um, I thought I'd give an anecdote for one of the things that I had found when working with ecologists, and um, I have a little preview from uh, Paul's talk. Difference and difference and Bakke. Okay, two columns, turns out these are pretty darn similar approaches, right? Economists like to call it difference and difference. Ecologists like to, to call it Bakke. So I'm working on this paper with myself, two ecologists, and a geographer. It's called Fishing for a Catch, and we're looking at marine protected areas and lobsters off the of Santa Barbara coast. So again, very nice parallel and nice teeing up with Paul. Um, and really what we care about is how does catch volume and value of the catch affected by these geographic closures, right? So I'm talking to Hunter, and I'm saying, we can do a difference in difference. We have before and after, and we'll just see, and we, I think we have some pretty nice ones that can show the trend underlying it. We'll do a difference in difference. And I write down the specification, and I'm seeing like beta, just beta will pop out the number that we want. He goes, no, 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 we need to do a Bakke. And I was like, I think that's before, after control intervention, right, or, or you know, impact. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, so this is the interaction effect, and it just gives us the net impact. No, 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 we need to do a Bakke. So we go back and forth, and finally, I'm like, OK, let's cartoonify this, right? So let's figure this out. And this is where the speaking the same language really starts to matter, is, OK, yes, we have a time trend, and we have some fish fallow, and we have some areas that are controlled, and we think they should be unaffected, SUPA, hopefully, you know, excluded. And then we have some impacted areas, and we know what their value is. So then we can layer over that the before and the after. And what Hunter wanted to see were these four, four dots. Right? So he says, OK, give me those four dots, before control, after control. And we see the control goes up by 0.5, and the, and the impact goes down by 1.5, so the net is negative 2. Right? What I wanted to see was the specification, because I think in identification, specification, difference, and difference. And so I just think this way instead. But again, there are just two ways of talking. You're kind of talking different languages, but we're trying to get to the same thing. And I think there's evidence of that throughout. So this is the difference in difference. OK, so once we're on the same page, getting to the right answers matters. And I think a lot of this is we're, controlling, we're comparing control and treatment, or we're, we're uh, trying to figure out what the impact of something is, either in the short run or the long run. Underlying that are going to be a lot of assumptions, right? So this gets back to Saul's two planets thing. So we have something like a planet. And there's a sea level on this planet. And through time, that sea level is doing stuff. And then maybe we're trying to do something to stop sea level rise. So we do that. And then we observe these gray dots are what we will observe. So I think these are going to be observations. What we would like, as Saul said, is some counterfactual, something, OK, what if we didn't do this program? Well, then it would have been higher. And, and yay, we have this negative impact. We've lowered sea level rise, right? The problem is we don't know that that happened. It could have been this way, and there was some behavioral, as Seema said, behavioral reoptimization. And oh, wow, we did a bunch of other stuff, and it actually backfired on us. And we had sea, level, sea levels would have otherwise actually been lower. So we have a lot of these things. And in reality, there's all of these possible future scenarios that could be going on. And we need a bunch of controls for those. And when we put in all those controls, we embed a ton of assumptions, right? So I really love this paper by Meredith Fowley, Marr, and um, Stephen Ryan. They measure leakage risk. Essentially, they just say if you clamp down on regulation in one place, those firms will go produce pollution somewhere else. And that could even be more problematic, because it might be more polluting. That's leakage, right? So you squeeze down. But what they really wanted to see in this policy report is how sensitive are these estimates to our specification, which is all these parameters we throw in and how we throw them in. It's basically like mixing the stew, and how does the stew taste, right? After you've put a lot of different stuff in. And what they find, so there's a lot of graphs, but just bear with me, is they look at different quartiles and different outcomes. But let's just focus on one right now. So at a lower quartile, basically these are elasticities, or responsiveness to comparative prices. And what that, how, how the distribution is. So this is almost 
200 specification outcomes. This is a histogram of almost 200 results of the same parameter. This isn't the standard errors on that parameter. Each of these parameters have a standard error of their own. And what you'll notice is sometimes they get a positive elasticity and sometimes they get a negative. So that's not real great for our, you know, when we're talking about the magnitude question um, earlier, what, what's the right answer, right? So, but they're really trying to um, broaden their scope as far as, okay, if we throw in a bunch of different specifications, what do we do? I talked to them at length, they said, so, so what do you do when you have 192 answers and they're not conforming to kind of converging on giving us one answer? And they're moving towards machine learning. We talked a little bit about structural. So there's other things that we have to kind of think about when we're not robust in getting the exact same answer. Okay, and then the last thing that I thought I'd talk about is harnessing citizen science. And Dan, Dan talked about this so a little bit. And I really love your example, Dan. I think this is a, is a great moving forward. So this idea of automatic data, data sensing or just motivating curiosity and having, having the people that are around us start to collect a bunch of data for us. So I thought I'd bring in four characters that have been with us for the last two days, these four characters, and just sort of talk about them a little bit. Um, okay, so you could imagine Luke here, he's wearing a smartwatch, and uh, Matt back here, he has a Fitbit on, and all the four of them have their cell phones in their pocket. And if they had certain apps running, we could be learning a lot more about what they're going, what's going on in their world right now, right? And we can time stamp it and geographically stamp it. And Google knows this, right? Did I go past it? Google absolutely <laughs> knows this. They know where we are all the time, and they know how fast we're going. This is this morning, terrible traffic in LA. And, but they should know then when we're not on a road. So I could turn on an app when I go for a hike, allow it to use my microphone, and it could pick up the birds chirping and the woodpeckers pecking, and we could correlate that with pollution in the, in the San Bernardino Mountains or the San Gabriels where I work or where I live. And I could be walking through saying, what is now the correlation for pollution, not just with asthma, but ecological productivity? Which I think is one of these areas that, yes, has this been happening? Yes, absolutely citizen science has been occurring, but we just now could harness this to even more of a degree because we all have these little devices and sensors in our pockets. The next thing is that we can motivate curiosity and collection for other people. So I think of this direct-to-consumer DNA testing as one of the ways that they have done a phenomenal job into tricking us to collect data for them. My motivation to swab my cheek and send them and pay them to do that so that I can figure out if my great-great-great-grandmother might be green hair woman, a Native American that I wrote, looked up in the census. True, true story. I don't know that yet because I haven't swabbed my cheek. But I will pay them and see, OK, maybe, like Rodrigo, I have some Native American ancestry. So this is a huge business. They are getting, and when you do this, you sign a disclaimer that says, you get to do anything basically with my genetic material you want to. So they are doing a ton of research on this, CRISPR and other gene theory and just a bunch of stuff on prevalence of diseases and where they're going. It's, it's an awesome research thing. But I think that in environmental stuff, we could be harnessing the same thing. So there's this app called iNaturalist, and this is one of many examples, but again, it's harnessing the, the, the fact that people are out in nature and want to do this, gain, gain their own value and utility by learning something about nature and gathering with 400 other scientists, learn about nature, sharing recording observations, create research quality data. So I think this is an awesome place to start getting more and more data. I know that water groups do this already. Instead of swabbing their cheek, you can go and take a little sample of water and get a lot of information that way. And I think that's a great thing. So just to, to sum up, oh, yeah, so they're just kind of finalizing this. They're, they've done it in forests. There's several papers on citizen science and leveraging this for effective cons conservation decision making. Um, so just summarizing, I think that what I've seen and what I'm hearing from everybody is it's sort of finding these common, big thinking, important goals to bring in additional and novel data with the caveat of how usable it is, and then to hopefully storify these questions, to find these nice narratives and, and really then articulate them in a, in a meaningful way. So thank you. <laughs>